to us. And I thank you for a wonderful children's message. I always know it's a great message when I think, well, I don't need to preach. She said it all. Uh, wonderful. Just hit all, hit all, everything need to be said, really. Uh, I want to tell you what we're going to be doing this next month and uh, into the early summer. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to be starting on a short sermon series on the book of Ruth. I uh, encourage you to take some time and read it a couple of nights this week just before bed. As I was laying in bed, I just read through the whole book. It really only takes about 10 minutes to read. Wonderful story of God's uh, gracious love shown through the love of the people there. It's one of those, to use the word, it's one of those feel-good stories that, you know, you, uh, you just can't read that book of Ruth without thinking, you know, how great it is when people live God's, you know, has said his loving kindness to one another. Today, however, we're looking at another uh, aspect of good news, this story of Zacchaeus, as we said uh, before. It's interesting to know that uh, Zacchaeus, if you were to ask the people back in his day in Jericho, if you were to ask them, what would you like remembered about us and our people in our town 2,000 years from now, the last thing they would have said was, we want you to remember Zacchaeus. In fact, they would have been horrified to think that of all the people in their fair town, Zacchaeus was the one you would remember. And yet, he is the one we remember today because of Jesus Christ's good news and grace and mercy in his life. You know, whenever I, I talk with people and they struggle with maybe concepts of God, uh, wh- for whatever reason, for whatever reason, I always tell them, you know what, just focus on Jesus. Just look at Jesus with, with the intensity of like a laser. You look at Jesus and you see who God is. You see God's posture toward us. And we look at Jesus in this story because, again, remember, the story really isn't about Zacchaeus. The story is about Jesus who reaches out to Zacchaeus. And this other man whom everybody in Jericho had written off as worthless, Jesus sees a soul in need of salvation. And Jesus literally invites himself to dinner, and, uh, and, and the man becomes saved. Now, I, I always love that part about Jesus inviting him. You know, ministers, and, and I wonder if Joshua, you feel this way, or Amy and Skip, once I became ordained, I, I felt like I had a certain permission in people's lives. I could just knock on your door. I usually don't. I usually call. But I could show up at your door to say hi, visit, or something like that. But imagine if I just went around the congregation and say, you know, Scott, I must eat at your house today. You know, <laughs> Barbara might have something to say about that, but it's really kind of funny. Jesus just stops in the tree. We don't know how he knew Zacchaeus. Well, we know he's the son of God. We don't know if, if people were maybe pointing him out. But Jesus just invites himself to dinner. And that one act of kindness opens up a door in this man's life, and he turns his life over to the Lord. I want to share the story with you, and then afterwards, just comment on a few things before we uh, get into the sermon today. It's uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Interestingly, Zacchaeus is only found in the Gospel of Luke. I don't know why the reason is for that, but uh, Luke shares a story. Jesus is in Jericho. Jericho is the last stop before Jerusalem and before the cross. And in essence, Jesus acts out the whole reason he's here in this encounter with Zacchaeus. Uh, You know, you used to think about these things. If you look at the story right before, it's Jesus healing a man who was blind on the way into Jericho. While he's in Jericho then, he's interrupted a second time. But I've learned, both in Jesus' ministry, my life, probably your lives, the interruptions we sometimes face aren't really interruptions. They may be the very work that God has called us to do. And we see that work in Jesus' ministry to Zacchaeus. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. Scripture says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, you need to hold those two side by side. In fact, something very interesting. The word tax collector in the Greek is the word telones. But... Zacchaeus is described in the Greek as an arctolones. He's a chief t- tax collector. It is, as far as we know, the only place today where we can find this word in all of Greek literature, not just biblical literature, but Greek literature. This guy was on top. And you know that the further you are into a system, the more complicit you are in that system's values. And so we find Zacchaeus, he is deeply embedded in this system of taxation. And it became wealthy. As Amanda said, he charged people too much for their taxes. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest 
of a sinner. Now, it's interesting that in Luke's gospel, last time we heard this is in Luke 15. Jesus is talking to tax collectors and sinners, and, and, and the, the Pharisees, the righteous people, the people who wore clothes like, like I'm wearing now, they all said, oh, well, he spends all his time with, with sinners. And then Jesus gives him three parables, the last one of the prodigal son, revealing why he had come. Verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus is actually there. He's, he's going back to the Mosaic Law, which called about how you make restitution to someone you've wronged. His repentance is genuine. His repentance is real. You know, in fact, it, it gives us a lesson. It's, a, it's really a whole other sermon, but... Repentance isn't just feeling bad about something. In fact, really, that's the last thing repentance is. I've heard this said once in, in something I read. I think it's wonderful. We'll, we'll talk about it sometime in the future. Repentance is the expulsive power of a new affection. Why don't you just roll that around in your mind for a second? The expulsive power of a new affection. Zacchaeus has a new affection in his life, and it makes his deeds something he wants to do. He's glad to do it. He's cheated people all these years. Now he says, Lord, I'm going to make restitution, and I'm going to go exactly what God's law says. Jesus follows up in verse 9. It says, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. These are very interesting words, because this is the last stop Jesus makes before he goes into Jerusalem where he does seek and save what is lost. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your holy word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. I'm not really thirsty. I'm just doing this because Blue Cremines did it (laughs) on Youth Sunday. Well, it's been called, it's been called America's number one disease. A condition so vast and so pervasive, actually, that it has the potential to affect nearly every man, woman, and child. Doesn't matter, young or old, rich or poor, famous or anonymous. It's a condition that has no regard for race or creed or color. An affliction that plays no favorites. It's called loneliness. Advice columnist Dear Abby and Ann Landers, they rank loneliness among the top concerns of their readers. And I'll bet there probably isn't a person here today who hasn't felt the icy grip of loneliness, at least at some point in their lives. Do you remember when you were loneliest? You know, I know of a man who says that his greatest experience of loneliness came after his wife was admitted to the hospital for emergency surgery. The doctors had detected in a, a large growth in this woman's abdomen, and, and uncertain of what they were dealing with, they felt they had no choice but to operate right away. Surgery was scheduled for early the next morning. Loneliness, this man says, Loneliness is having to leave your wife at the hospital and coming home to an empty house, sitting up all night in front of the glow of the TV, too worried to sleep. Loneliness is the night before surgery. But loneliness is also such things as hearing your spouse say, I don't love you anymore, or being chosen last for the team. Loneliness is being home by yourself on prom night, in a new place, not knowing a soul, or staring at a stack of unpaid bills with no money in the bank. Loneliness is having a secret you feel like you just can't share with anybody else. It's missing someone you love, or simply eating alone. And loneliness is sitting by yourself in a tree, watching crowd go by. 
Zacchaeus was a lonely man. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But Zacchaeus' loneliness, you know, it wasn't because of some tragedy or some misfortune in his life. It, it wasn't because of something beyond his control. The fact is, Zacchaeus had nobody to blame but himself for his loneliness, mostly because of the way he lived his life. As, as Amanda said, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which, as you might imagine, didn't exactly make him the most popular guy in town. In fact, if, if you think about it, a lot of things have changed from biblical times till now. But one thing that hasn't changed is how we all feel about taxes. And I mean, we all probably breathe a sigh of relief after April 15th, right, Tommy? Right? Especially tax preparers and accountants. Just that burden of having to have our taxes done and, and sent to the IRS is this, this huge stress in our lives. And so after the 15th, a lot of us feel we can just, you know, breathe easier like this Great big weight has been lifted off our shoulders. But what most folks don't realize is that Tax Freedom Day isn't actually April 15th. That's just a deadline for filing your returns. Tax Freedom Day is that day when you've actually worked long enough to satisfy your tax obligations for the whole year. And I bet it wouldn't surprise you to learn that that day keeps getting later and later every year. For example, on average, for this year, it took almost 108 days, 108 days, to work off all your taxes, which is four more days than last year. Now, you imagine that, working three and a half months of your life every day just for the government. Three and a half months before you ever really see a penny for yourselves. You know, I found it amazing, but when it's added up, most Americans fork over about 29% of their income in federal, state, and local taxes. That's more than most of us spend on food and clothing and housing combined. And I don't want you to get me wrong, though. I realize paying taxes is part of living in a civilized society. You know, I get that. And we've all got to pay our fair share. But see, that's the rub. Somehow the system doesn't always seem fair, does it? Well, you know, if that's the way we feel, folks felt even more disgusted by it in Zacchaeus' day. You see, back then, there weren't any deductions you could claim, or there weren't any shelters where you could stick your money. You paid what the Roman government said you paid. Or rather, you paid what people like Zacchaeus said the Roman government said you paid. See, in order to collect these taxes, the Romans usually subcontracted out folks like Zacchaeus. And the understanding was that as long as Rome got their cut, people like Zacchaeus were free to charge the people whatever they could get away with and pocket the extra for themselves. That's how Zacchaeus got so rich, and he was good at it. So good, the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus just wasn't any old tax collector. He was a chief tax collector, the Arctolones, the guy in charge. He was right at the top of the food chain so that at some point, at some point, every dime in revenue eventually had to trickle through his fingers. And you better be sure Zacchaeus always got his cut. So he made a bundle, for sure. But Zacchaeus discovered, you know, there was a downside to it all, too. You see, even though Zacchaeus became a, a very wealthy man, he also became a lonely man. Nobody wanted anything to do with him, and, and really, who could blame them? Zacchaeus was a chiseler. He was a cheat. He was a traitor to his own people. He was a man who'd sold his soul and for a few bucks would swindle his own mother. Aristotle once was quoted as saying that no man or no one would choose a friendless existence on the condition of having all other things in the world. But you know, this is exactly what Zacchaeus had done. And it left him all alone without a friend in the world, a victim of his own choices. You know, Zacchaeus reminds me of an old man I used to know in Pennsylvania. His name was Muggs, Muggs Mason. Muggs was a widower and lived by himself, and so I used to stop by and see him from time to time. And, you know, I like Muggs. Muggs, Muggs is okay, even though I, you know, I really, I, I hated going to his house. I hated it because it was so filthy. I mean, the place was an absolute wreck. Roaches, cockroaches scurried across the floor. The whole place reeked of stale urine. It, it was almost unbearable in the summer. You couldn't hardly breathe. It was obvious Muggs couldn't take care of himself anymore. Well, you know, when I learned that Muggs had two grown sons living nearby, you know, it really bothered me. 
bothered me that, that anybody would let someone they loved live in those kind of conditions. And for a while, I felt a great deal of resentment towards Muggs' sons. But then I met them, and I discovered there was another side to the story. Fact was, as I later learned, that Muggs' sons did care about their dad, and they had tried helping their father. They, they offered to move him into their own homes. They offered to help find adequate nursing care so he could stay in his own home. But, you know, Muggs was a very stubborn, angry old man who, for whatever reasons, refused their help. And so he just sat there day after day, all alone in his stinking house, complaining that no one loved him and that nobody cared. We and I learned from Muggs that sometimes, sometimes we're responsible for our own loneliness. Not all the time, certainly, but, but enough of the time. Like much of sin, the consequences we have to deal with are so often self-inflicted, usually as a result of the choices we make. And Zacchaeus had made his. And these choices had left him in a place he didn't want to be. I mean, sure, he, he might have lived in a gated community, had the biggest house on the block, covered patio in a swimming pool out back. But he had nobody to share them with. He had nobody to share his life with. He was by himself and all alone. I mean, is it any wonder as, as we read the story Zacchaeus couldn't even find a place to stand in the crowd as Jesus passed by. Nobody would give him the time of day. And why should they? As far as they were concerned, Zacchaeus was a lost cause. There was no way a guy like him could ever turn his life around. And you know what? They were right. They were right, at least in that regard. Zacchaeus couldn't turn his life around. But Jesus could. In his book, Love Beyond Reason, John Ortberg, one of my favorite authors, pastors, tells the story of his sister, Barbie, and of Barbie's favorite doll, whom she called Pandy. When Pandy was young and a looker, Ortberg says, Barbie loved her. She loved her with a love that was too strong for Pandy's own good. So when Barbie went to bed at night, Pandy lay next to her. When Barbie had lunch... Pandy ate beside her at the table. When Barbie could get away with it, Pandy took a bath with her. Barbie's love for that doll was, from Pandy's point of view, pretty near a fatal attraction. By the time I knew Pandy, Ortberg says, she was not a particularly attractive doll. In fact, to tell the truth, she was a mess. She was no longer a very valuable doll. I'm not sure we could have even given her away. But for reasons no one could ever quite figure out, in the way kids sometimes do, my sister Barbie loved that little rag doll. She loved her as strongly in the days of Pandy's raggedness as she had ever loved her in the days of her great beauty. Other dolls came and went. Pandy was family. Love Barbie, love her rag doll. It was a package deal. He said, once we took a vacation from our home in Rockford, Illinois, to Canada. We had returned almost all the way home when we realized that the Illinois border, that Pandy had not come with us. She had remained behind at the hotel in Canada. No other option was thinkable. My father turned the car around and we drove from Illinois all the way back to Canada. We were a devoted family, Ortberg says. Not a particularly bright family, but devoted. We rushed into the hotel and checked with the desk clerk in the lobby. No pandy. We went back to our room. No pandy. We ran downstairs and, and found the laundry room. Pandy was there, wrapped up in the sheets, about to be washed to death. The measure of my sister's love for that doll, he says, was that she would travel all the way to a distant country to save her. Well, Ortberg says that in time, Barbie grew up and Pandy got packed away and stuck in a box in an attic for about 20 years. But eventually, Barbie got married and had a little girl of her own. And when that little girl wanted a doll for herself, no other option was thinkable. Ortberg says, Barbie went back to the attic 
and dragged out the box. By this time, though, Pandy was more rag than doll. So my sister took her to a doll hospital in California. He says, yes, there really are such places. And she had Pandy go through reconstructive surgery. Pandy was given a facelift or liposuction or whatever it is they do for dolls. Until after 30 years, Pandy became once again as beautiful on the outside as she had always been in the eyes of the one who loved her. I'm not sure she looked any better to Barbie, Ortberg says. But now it was possible for others to view what Barbie had always seen in her. You know, I think a lot of the same thing is going on here when Jesus stops and calls Zacchaeus down out of that tree. I mean, to everybody else, Zacchaeus was the scum of the earth. Somebody the world would be better off without a complete waste of human space. But that's not how Jesus saw him. In fact, Jesus says, this man too is a son of Abraham. In other words, he mattered. He mattered a lot. You see, in God's eyes, there are no throwaway people. Nobody's here by accident. Not Zacchaeus, not even you. You matter to God. You matter eternally. That's why Jesus came to seek and save the lost and to bring us out of our loneliness and back into a relationship with God. You see, just like that doll that Ortberg's sister loved so much, the measure of God's love was how far he would travel to save us, even if it meant traveling all the way to the cross. And it sounds like a lot, and really, it is. It is a lot. Jesus gave all he had for us, as the scripture says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the cost cost was great, but to the one who loves us and has redeemed us, no other option was thinkable. Of course, some might say what Jesus did that day was pretty risky. I mean, you think about it, he, he goes to Jericho, he comes there, and he receives a hero's welcome. When he leaves, everybody's mad, they're complaining, they're grumbling. Why? Why? Well, because they think Zacchaeus has gotten off too easily. That Jesus had been too lenient with him, and, and maybe you think so too. See, I'll, I'll admit that to our way of thinking, there's something unusual about a man who would leave the favor of an adoring crowd to go have supper with a swindler and a cheat. It's unusual. Just as I suppose there's something unusual about a God whom Jesus said, like a shepherd, will leave 99 sheep on a hillside in order to go search for that one out of a hundred that's lost. I mean, it, it seems impractical, unrealistic. It just seems just plain foolish to expend so much time and energy on just one. That is, unless you're the one who's lost. And then you understand what God's grace is all about. They've called him Wrong Way Regals a nickname unfortunately earned many years ago when Georgia Tech was playing UCLA in the Rose Bowl. It was late in the first half of the game when a young man named Roy Regals recovered a fumble for UCLA. But picking the ball up in all the confusion, Regals got turned around and began running in the wrong way. He went 65 yards in the wrong direction before a teammate finally caught him and tackled him just before the end zone. But his mistake was costly, and it put UCLA in terrible field position. Well, UCLA went three and out, and they were forced to punt, backed up against their own end zone. Georgia Tech blocked the punt and scored, and it totally demoralized the Bruins. At halftime, the locker room was pretty quiet. Coach didn't have much to say, and Roy Regals, Roy, he just sat there by himself all alone in a corner with a blanket draped over his shoulders his head in his hands, not believing what he'd done. Well, when the timekeeper announced that it was uh, time to go back onto the field, the coach announced 
that the same players who had started the first half would start the second. Everybody got up and went out to the field. Everybody except Roy Regals. Regals just sat there. So the coach looked over and called to him. Regals didn't move. Finally, he went over to where Regal sat, hidden in his blanket, and he said to him, Roy, didn't you hear me? The same team that started the first half will start the second. But Regals looked up at him, tears in his eyes, and he said, Coach, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined myself, and I've ruined the university's reputation. I can't go back out there and face that crowd. But Regal's coach reached out and put his hand on his shoulder. And he said gently to him, he said, Roy, get up and go on back. The game is only half over. You know, I doubt there isn't a person here today who hasn't felt like Roy Regals or even like Zacchaeus at some time in their lives. And you know, there's a world full of people out there still running in the wrong direction. People running confused, people running lonely, people running scared and lost. They're out there. The world is full of folks out on a limb. They're our friends, our neighbors. They're our family and people we work with at one time. They were even us. Folks who don't know that the God they've been looking for is the same God who's always been looking for them and shows them how far he's willing to go by going all the way to the cross. And so the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is whether we're content as disciples of Jesus Christ, as members of FTC, whether we're content to just let these folks stay where they are, or whether we're willing to go out on a limb ourselves, seeing them the way Jesus Christ sees them. Who knows? The simplest effort on our part may be just the encouragement somebody else needs to come down out of their tree and into the arms of their Savior. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for that passion that searched us out when we were lost, Lord. When we, too, were out on a limb by ourselves, alienated from you, Lord. Having no relationship with God. And, Lord Jesus, you came and you sought us and you found us. You bring us the good news, Lord. Just like Zacchaeus, Lord, you say, this one, too, is a son of Abraham, a daughter of Abraham. This one, too, is a child of God. And the Lord, you purchased our redemption with your blood on the cross. Lord Jesus, help us always rejoice in your love, the fellowship we now share. But Lord, help us not to be content in that. Help us, Lord, not to be content within these walls, secure in our own church family, Lord. But help us to seek those, Lord, who are still up a tree, out on a limb, alienated from you. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, give us the grace to offer an encouraging word, Lord, that invites people down and into a relationship with you. Lord, we pray this not by our own strength, but the power of your Spirit. And Jesus, we thank you for loving us. And like Zacchaeus, Lord, calling us by name into fellowship and union with you. In your name, Lord, we pray and give thanks.